Hello, everyone. This talk is titled 10 More Ways to Blow Up Your Kubernetes by Airbnb. And this talk is titled 10 More Ways because we have found more ways to blow up since last year's talk. Uh, that, that was presented by our colleagues, uh, Melanie and Bruce. So uh, who are we? My name is Jen. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Airbnb on the compute infrastructure team. This is a team that manages our Kubernetes clusters and manages the abstraction we have over it to make developing services easier. Hi, my name is Joseph and I'm on the compute infra team with Jin. I've been on this team and at Airbnb for about eight months now. So the outline of this talk will be one, we're gonna give a brief intro of Kubernetes at Airbnb. Uh, two, we're gonna dive into 10 cases of how we actually uh, mess things up. And three, uh, we're gonna go over and do a recap. All right, Kubernetes and containers at Airbnb. So Airbnb started our migration to Kubernetes from the beginning of 2018. And since then, it has really taken off. Uh, Kubernetes is actually running in production and we rely on it. It is a critical part of our of running Airbnb. Our environment uh, is mostly Amazon Linux 2 for the actual host. Uh, we use Ubuntu images. We use Canal for our C CNI plugin. We do use node port services and and smart stack for service discovery. And we support many languages such as Ruby, Java, Python, and Go services. Now let's dive into the real fun stuff. The first case we're gonna talk about is called replicating replica sets. So for context, we have a job that regularly scrapes our clusters and it runs a command something like kubectl get pods all namespaces. This job starts getting out of memory errors in one specific cluster. So let's check it out. Uh, and what do we see? We see that in most of our normal clusters, we have maybe on an order of 1,000 to 2,000 replica sets. Any guesses to how many this problematic cluster had? It was 56,000. So let's see what else is up with this cluster. When we dive into all these replica sets, we notice that all of these are actually under one deployment, one namespace. And when we dive deeper into it, we also notice that the deployment object, uh, when we check its collision count, it was up to 100,000. And so right now our theory is likely that the deployment object is creating replica sets that aren't getting adopted by it. So it keeps on creating more. As we dive more into this incident, uh, we realize that something different about the deployment of this job on this specific cluster that was different from its deployment on other clusters was this one, we were actually testing this new feature called topology spread constraints. And what we noticed that were that these specs were actually not getting picked up by the replica sets. And the theory here is because the replica sets being created by the deployment didn't have these specs, uh, the deployment didn't know that it had already created these replica sets. It didn't know that these replica sets belong to it. And so it would just keep on creating more and more replica sets. And good thing we have so many, we had so many test clusters so we can actually like diff the specific deployments to see what was going on. And in this specific incident, the actual fix was simply just deleting the whole namespace, uh, which is fine because this was just a test cluster. And good thing we were just testing this feature out in our test cluster. And so the takeaway here is do you test new features in test clusters because for us, that's what they're for. We were testing this new feature and what we noticed was it kind of blew up our cluster and just kept creating infinite replica sets, but not a problem. Uh, we know to investigate more before we roll this out to production. Our second incident is called mutating time bomb. And what we see here is we, we have the service experiencing high error rate and uh, the service cannot deploy and we get this cryptic Kubernetes error saying, uh, unable to access invalid index five. So we dive deeper into it and we check the status of it. And what do we see? We see that two, two pods are running at what well, HPA thinks there should be nine replicas running. And the service is panicking because, well, we only have two pods left. Digging more into it, we notice um, there's only one deployment object, but three replica sets, which is really weird. And the replica sets that actually have pods are 16 days old. 
as we dug more into it, we noticed, uh, yeah, th there's something really wrong going on with the HPA here and the replica sets. And one hour later, what have we tried? Well, we tried deleting the HPA and manually scaling it up because the uh, theory was perhaps there was something wrong with the HPA. Uh, that did not work. Uh, we tried deleting those old bad replica sets, thinking perhaps it was those old replica sets that were blocking new deploys from happening, but that was not the problem. Uh, we also made sure not to delete the replica set that had our last two pods running. We also tried creating a new deployment object just to update it, just to kick it and see what happens. That did not solve our problems. And we thought about perhaps just recreating the namespace, uh, but that would definitely delete the last two pods running, uh, which is no good because this service is production. So what do we do now? We page a teammate, we call a friend one hour later. Uh, and so when we started digging more into it, uh, we come back to the first page uh, where someone had called out this cryptic error message. And we should have done this earlier where and should have dug more into it because we realized that this was actually the exact problem. When we Googled for the problem, we noticed it was actually a problem with JSON patching and related to our mutating emission controller, uh, which was recently rolled out in the last month. Uh, specifically, the bug was this with our mutating emission controller. Imagine that on the top left is our input and this is our spec and our desired output is the spec um, at the bottom left. Uh, here we see we are deleting two items from an, an array. What the bug was, the generated output is this. Uh, we, it generates two operations. Uh, it removes index two and removes index three. In our first class glance, uh, this patch looks reasonable, but the problem is after the first operation, um, the array doesn't have an index three anymore. So the correct patch is you actually remove index three, then index two. Uh, and luckily this issue was already well known, but we Googled for it and we can actually um, apply it. And so once we realized it was a mutating emission controller uh, to stop the bleed, uh, we did actually deleted the mutating emission controller from the specific cluster, which immediately resulted in successful pods coming up. And so our immediate fire is resolved. So we're done, right? No. As we dug into it more, we realized our change had actually happened seven days ago. We realized that for some deployments over the last seven days, new code actually wasn't even being deployed. Services were being kept alive by their old replica sets, but over time as pods of the old replica set slowly died off, uh, services were slowly getting degraded. Yeah, so this problem was way more insidious uh, than we had realized. And the takeaway here is uh, be aware of the existence of a mutating emission controller. Uh, this was something we had recently wrote out. And so for many of us, uh, when we see an incident, it doesn't immediately come to mind to think, hey, it could be the mutating emission controller. Uh, be willing to ask for help because uh, paging our additional team member to help us uh, definitely got us moving. Do Google the error messages and uh, do create alerts. When we dug more into it later during the postmortem, we realized we actually do have metrics that could have uh, detected this problem earlier. All right, our next incident is called um, one to auto scaling. Uh, so we're gonna begin with this Kubernetes issue. This is still an open issue. The gist of it is, let's say you have the situation where you have a deployment with three replica. Later, you set up um, an HPA or horizontal pod auto scaler with a much larger number. You then update your deployment and apply it. But this is where the problem happens. Uh, the moment you apply that and, or update that deployment, the number of replica resets down to three. And so the suggested solution outlined by comment was remove replicas from the last deployment and remove replicas from the current and future deployment to let the HPA do its thing. And that sounded good to us. And so we ship it. Great, so our fix right now is uh, if there's a deployment at HPA, we, we follow the advice of the comment by editing the last deployment and deleting the replica account from it, removing the replicas from our current deployment and applying the deployment. But that was not the end of our auto scaling woes. So this next case is called zero to auto scaling. So if you actually look at the HPA algorithm, 
this is the algorithm where desired replicas is a function of your current replicas. Some of you might already see the problem. If current replicas is zero, desired replicas will always be zero. So this is a sounds like a quick and easy fix, and we ship it right. And so now our fix looks like if if deployment and HPA, and if replica is not zero, uh, then we apply that fix. Otherwise, if replica was zero, we can actually just leave it alone, and the HPA will do the correct thing. Zero to auto scaling again, but that 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 was not our final problem with the HPA. So in this incident, someone. Alerted us uh, when they when they did a deploy, their number of replicas actually dropped to zero. So let's see what happened here. Someone followed up and realized, uh, yes, this is actually a known issue which we had already fixed, but we were actually migrating our deployment services to Spinnaker, and Spinnaker did not have this standard workaround implemented yet. And so the lesson here is uh, migrations are hard, and so now the fix is. Oh, and remember to copy this logic to Spinnaker. And uh, once more, uh, we have more auto scaling issues. So what do you think happens in this scenario? You have a service that just migrated to Kubernetes and still has old EC2 boxes running. We deploy this to service to Kubernetes with replicas equals zero. We then scale the service in Kubernetes using kubectl Q- scale deployment. And nice, we, we realize that Kubernetes is now taking traffic successfully. And so we delete all of our old EC2 boxes. And so now the service has fully migrated to Kubernetes. And now we deploy again with HPA. Uh, that's right, an incident happens. Uh, and the actual bug here is we had manually scaled this deployment with kubectl scale deployment. But this means the last, the most recent proper deployment was actually still zero replica. We didn't go through a proper deployment or what what our infrastructure teams consider a proper deployment because they had used the the kubectl tool directly to scale up their replicas. And so now our fix is uh, add a warning to uh, kubectl scale deployment tool to warn people that this is like a temporary tool, but they should still go through a normal deploy process and to actually check what the current replica count is. And our takeaway here is uh, turning on horizontal pod autoscaler for the first time is not trivial. Uh, You should test your edge cases such as zero, one, et cetera. And remember the non-paved paths because even though we had fixed this issue in our normal deploy tool, Spinnaker was uh, a new new path that was still being paved. And our next case is called, uh, did we really delete all all our master nodes? Yes, yes, we did. And what happens when you delete um, all the master nodes on a cluster is it means there's no API server, uh, kubectl commands do not work, there's no new deploys, and the cluster is just broken. But luckily for us, this was just a test cluster. Um, and, and so as we try to figure out uh, how can we bring this cluster back up, uh, our options were one, completely delete the cluster and, and bring it up all over again, or two, actually try to fix it in place. Uh, and so these are pretty bad situations to be in, but luckily this was still a test. This was just a test cluster. And one of our engineers realized actually uh, the situation was already documented in our run book where the suggestion was one, delete our mutation controller as an immediate action via the kubectl command, and two, uh, terminate the kube DNS pod to get it rescheduled. The problem with trying to bring up your masters once they have all gone down is the order in terms of how you bring things back up really matters. In this specific case, uh, following the runbook allowed uh, the necessary services to actually start up again and get unblocked for the masters to actually come up successfully. And the takeaway here is don't drain your master nodes. If you do, do check your runbooks. Our next scenario, our next case is called uh, masters out of memory. So for this specific incident, um, we noticed our master uh, CPU usage uh, going up. We noticed that the Cube API server is going wild and is using up lots of CPU and memory. Our etcd resource counts are shooting up and we're getting uh, out of memory errors on our API server. And our alerts are firing 
um, more alerts are firing and more alerts are firing. So this is an, this is a real incident. We also realized as we, as we dug more into it is that uh, we actually had no access either. Uh, when we tried to SSH in to debug, uh, we noticed uh, we noticed that the, the nodes were having real issues and we actually couldn't get in. So what is happening here? So our API server is uh, ooming and crashing. Our control plane nodes are severely degraded. We don't have SSH access to them. We, we wonder, is this an etcd problem? Is etcd having issue? Because uh, etcd is having issues, uh, things would be really bad. And we noticed uh, it was having elevated objects being created, but it's actually still healthy and fine. And existing workloads are, are also still fine. So our, our response here was to spin up uh, bigger instances for the control plane for the masters. And, and this was done just in time because our old instances actually just completely died. And we noticed that memory was uh, still getting eaten up super fast, but good thing uh, these new instances are much bigger. And so for postmortem, we realized um, this was actually one of our largest clusters that was happening, that was having this issue. So we were wondering, is this um, a new scaling limitation that, that we've just hit? We also realized the incident lined up with a deploy that had dramatically increased their max surge value. And that deploy was having crash loops. Uh, and the theory here is uh, the, that deployed with a high max search value, while it was crash looping, it was actually overwhelming our API server. And the takeaway here is uh, uh, restricting max search would help protect the cluster. And it's a good idea to be ready to scale vertically. Uh, we were lucky that we were able to spin up um, bigger instances for our control plane to make sure that they scaled. But for this incident, we actually still have some ongoing unknowns, such as uh, what exactly is a breaking point in terms of uh, pods or max surge. We've also had larger clusters in the past before, and but we didn't run into this issue. So the question is, what is different now? And three, uh, why did memory usage actually jump suddenly? Um, if you remember from our graphs, the API servers were actually using up to like 50, 90 gigs of memory. Uh, which is odd because etcd you know can only have can only use up uh, eight gigs of memory so what was actually using it all up authentication in the world of containerization at airbnb we rely on aws im roles as a primary way to authenticate our services this is simple enough in the traditional non-containerized world where each ec2 instance can have their own im role and they can assume that role and they can request the EC2 metadata API to receive temporary credentials. But what happens when you have multiple pods and services running within a single instance? We could let each pod assume any of the other pods roles or make one big um, IAM role to encapsulate all of the pods that will be running on it. But we don't want to give each pod more authentication or permissions than it needs. To address this issue, we use an open source project called Kube2IM. Kube2IM provides IAM credentials to containers running inside a Kubernetes cluster based on annotations. But what does this really mean? Well, Kube2IM works by running as a daemon set within the cluster. When a pod makes a request to the EC2 API, Kube2IM intercepts the request. Then using a special IAM role of its own, it assumes the pod's IAM role then it makes a request to the EC2 API itself, receives the temporary credentials for the pod, and then forwards it back. Now, kube2im didn't, wasn't perfect. It came with some race conditions. So the expected course of events are as follows with kube2im. First, the node should start up. Then the kube2im pod start up. Then we add an IP table rule to forward request to the EC2 API's IP address to the kube2im pod. Then kube2im starts watching for new pods, after which an application's pod can start up. Then kube2im notices a new pod, caches the pod's IP address to its AWS IAM role mapping. Then finally, the container in the pod can make a request to the EC2 API. However, what we were seeing was that containers would make requests to the EC2 API before kube2im had even noticed the pod come up. And because so, when kube2im receives requests, 
it would not be able to find the pod's IP address within its own cache, and it would just reject the requests. This was especially problematic with init containers, which would run before all of the other containers. So our solution, another init container. That's right. We made a new init container called cube to IM wait that would basically just keep pinging the EC2 API until it received a successful response back. This works because we had already set the IP table rule before to forward request to cube to IM. So if we got a successful response back, that means cube to IM responded successfully, meaning it had already noticed the pod come up. Now, this is only a temporary solution. We're currently working on a new authentication scheme by which we have the API server use its own private key to sign a token and inject it into a pod on startup. Then when a pod needs to get authenticated, it uses a different API to get credentials for the pod's IAM role um, using the signed token. Then the STS verifies the token signature is valid with the public keys, after which, after the validation was, is complete, STS returns the temporary credentials back to the pod. Our main takeaways here is that init containers are very versatile despite their simplicity, and they're good solutions even if they're only temporary. CPU limit equals number of CPU cores in the node still has throttling. So one day we got a message from an engineer asking us, can you explain why we'd still see throttling when limit is set to 36? With only 36 cores, how can we exceed 36? So to kind of give context on this, let's first talk about how CPU limits work on Kubernetes. Kubernetes limits pod CPU usage using Linux's C groups and the CFS, the completely fair scheduler. So let's take an example of a 36 core machine with a default scheduling period of 100 milliseconds. And let's say we have in our Kubernetes manifest limits set to CPU of 1024 millicores. That's equivalent to one CPU core. This gets translated into Linux's CPU.CFS underscore quota of 100 because we have the 100 millisecond default scheduling period times one core, which gives us 100. Now let's take a few different scenarios. Um, here we have a bunch of different scheduling periods. And in our first scenario, we have one container running one thread um, and it can run the full 100 milliseconds without any throttling. Now let's say the container actually had two threads. Then thread one and two can run simultaneously for 50 milliseconds, after which it will get throttled because the combined usage within that container would have reached 100 milliseconds. Now, in our final scenario, we have thread one, two, and three running simultaneously. And then thread one and two either terminates or gets descheduled after 25 milliseconds. Then thread three can run for an additional 25 milliseconds until it would have reached the full 100 milliseconds of its quota, after which the threads from that container will get throttled. So in our previous scenario, we had um, in our limits, a CPU limit of 36 times 1,024 millicores, which gets translated into a CFS quota of 3,600. So in that case, we should be able to run, um, we should be able to run our threads on all 36 cores for a full 100 milliseconds within that period or within any CFS period and not get throttled at all. So to figure out what was going on, we ran a bunch of tests. We made one app with a limit of 36 CPU and we made another app with no limits at all. And we ran them on different nodes, swap nodes. And we found that on average, they all ran pretty much with the same performance. But what was surprising was that despite the similar performance, we actually did see throttling on um, the app with CPU limits set to 36. So our main takeaways here were that some throttling is inherent and is okay, and that we should be, be more careful of our metrics. Docker built-in CPU usage information may not actually be granular enough to capture fully what's going on. We also learned that percentage of throttled periods is a better metric than absolute value of periods, since the latter is very heavily affected by the number of threads running within the container. 
CPU limits cause out of memory kills? In Kubernetes, we have memory limits and CPU limits. And intuitively, memory limits cause out of memory kills if they are exceeded, and CPU limits would cause throttling. And they do. But we are also seeing that CPU limits were causing out of memory kills. So here's an example. We have on the top left our pod usage spike a little bit after 12, after which it was immediately followed by a huge spike in memory usage and eventually an out of memory kill. So what's going on here? Well, the first reason was that these were Java processes and the JVM garbage collector is intensive and spawns a lot of threads. And the more threads there are running concurrently, the faster each container can get throttled. There's two main flags to be concerned with here, parallel GC threads and concurrent GC threads um, within Java. And these two parameters are used for different stages of the garbage collection, but the number of threads used for garbage collection for either of these flags can easily exceed the number of threads in the main application. And when both the main application and the garbage collector is being throttled, we can have a situation where data isn't being processed and any data that is processed is not able to be freed. Our second and third problem was that only certain containers get throttled and the back pressure we had in place to kind of mitigate this wasn't working properly. So since Kubernetes relies on Linux C groups to implement throttling, this meant that certain containers in the pod can get throttled while some other containers aren't. In our case, we had the main container processing the data get throttled while another container, Envoy, accepting requests was not. This meant that we kept, this meant that we were continuously accepting requests while we were unable to process them. And we were unable to, again, because the garbage collector for the main container was also um, being throttled, we couldn't free the memory properly either. We had back pressure in place to mitigate this, um, to tell the clients to stop sending requests in an event something like this happened, but it wasn't working properly at the time. So our main takeaways here, be wary of what other processes may be running on the pod and adjust limits accordingly. Tune JVM garbage collector threads if necessary. And to make sure to have proper back pressure to avoid overloading our services. Rogue ECR cleaner. At Airbnb, we make a lot of Docker images. This data is from 2019. And at the time we were making over 2 million Docker images per day. And obviously we can't keep them all, but we also can't do something naive like deleting all the old images because we don't know which images might be in use. So we built a service called the CR cleaner that runs as a cron job every hour. And basically all it does is it finds all the images in use then it loops through each of our ECR repos and deletes all the old images except for the ones in use. Fairly simple. Um, and it was working great until it wasn't. ECR Cleaner started deleting images in production. And to figure out what's going on, let's go back and look at what it was doing. Um, and specifically, let's look at the find all images in use function. Basically, it would find all the clusters then keep a list of active images, then loop through each cluster, figure out what images are being used by all the pods, add to that list, and return the list of active images. Well, in the recent change, there was an error case. And on error, it would just return an empty list. And you can guess what happens afterwards. Since our list of clusters is empty, it finds no images and returns an empty list of images. Then going back up, um, it would loop through each repository and delete all the old images except for nothing. So it would just start arbitrarily deleting all the old images. And our second mistake was a lack of proper alerting. ECR cleaner was failing, but we weren't getting alerts for that. And we also weren't getting alerts for image pull backoff errors in production across 
multiple pods. But once we figured out that this was happening, our fix was to first shut down ECR cleaner to prevent it from deleting more images, then look for crash looping containers, look through ECR cleaner logs, um, and kind of cross-reference them to figure out what images were missing and manually rebuild them all. On the right, you can see a teammate um, rebuilding all these images and keeping track. And this is only a short snippet of all the images that we had to rebuild. And it was very tedious, so thank you, kind teammate. And our takeaways here were that the more critical the service, the more crucial and thorough testing and review should be. And we should have proper error handling and alerts for infrastructural issues. And we should also try to make sure that our fixes aren't causing problems elsewhere. In this case, because we were rebuilding so many images, we were causing other people's builds to slow down a lot. Um, and we should have seen, foreseen that. Be careful what you break. As part of our on-call readiness goals, we started doing fire drills. So this is what they looked like. Someone would set something up and send a message in our Slack channel. So for example, fire drill, CI is broken and we cannot do a build for ECR cleaner. We need to ship a new version to production that displays a new logline on startup without relying on CI. Evan, who is on call, disclaimer, CI is not really broken. Do not panic, this is a drill. This is only a drill. And we did a lot of these and we found a lot of bugs, a lot of places to improve our code and our documentation, and it was great. But there was one particular fire drill that was pretty interesting, but also pretty insightful. And it had to do with the admission controller. This was actually one of the first fire drills that I did as a new member in the team. So it was meant to be simple. Basically, a change was made in the admission controller to block any creations of a replica set. And it looks something like this. It's a new rule that said if the resource being applied is a replica set, return an error. And the fix was supposed to be simple. Just find an old working commit and deploy that back onto the test cluster that we were using. And that's exactly what I did. And that was that. And it was all going fine until a few days later, the same person who had made the fire drill sent this in our team chat. I deployed onto the test cluster, but it's as if the admission controller didn't get deployed, even though the deploy went through. Has anyone seen that before? Well, I didn't know at the time, but as it turned out, I had seen it before. When I went back to deploy an old commit, um, I thought the deploy had gone through, but admission controller didn't actually get deployed. What happened was that there was a bug in our deploy process reporting success for failed deploys specifically to admission controller in this case. But why was admission controller failing in the first place? Well, it was because admission controller was not whitelisted by the admission controller. This meant that since the admission controller was blocking all replica sets, it was also blocking itself from being deployed. So we were locked out. So our solution, just delete the validating web configuration for the admission controller. And that way we should be able to bypass the um, admission controller step. But this didn't work either. And that's because when a request is sent to the API server, it goes through a bunch of steps, eventually lands on the validating admission step, at which point it takes a look at the validating web configuration resource, which is what we had deleted, to figure out what webhooks it should um, get confirmation from. But as it turns out, on our admission controller deploys, the validating webhook configuration is applied before the webhook, the webhook. This meant that by the time it got for us to update our webhook, which is where the bad rule was, the validating webhook configuration has had already been replaced. So the actual solution, just nuke the whole thing, delete the mutating admission controller webhook, delete the deployment, and then redeploy the entire thing from scratch. So our takeaways here, Double check that your deploys actually went through. Make sure that the thing that controls your deploys can actually fix itself with another deploy. Be aware of Kubernetes apply ordering and that even a simple fire drill can reveal a lot of insights and bugs. And TLDR, never, never write a rule that blocks all replica sets. All right, to recap, uh, some of our top 10 takeaways are uh, one, do test new features in test clusters. 
to uh, be aware of the existence of mutating emission controller. Uh, three, remember the non-paved paths or uh, whatever new paths you might be paving. Four, uh, don't drain your master nodes. Uh, five, be ready to scale vertically. And eight containers are versatile despite their simplicity and are good solutions even if they're only temporary. Some throttling is inherent and is okay. Be wary of what other processes may be running on the pod and adjust limits accordingly. Have proper error handling and alerts for infrastructural issues. And be aware of Kubernetes apply ordering. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, this is the end of our presentation. If you would like to learn more, uh, check out our engineering blog. Um, Airbnb is also still hiring and a lot of the work we share today uh, were not done by just me or me or Joseph. Uh, it was all done by um, our wonderful team. So if you like, if you would like to work with us, uh, reach out, apply. And if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to contact us um, to follow up. Thank you.